Were you bullied? What emotions come up for you as a teacher when you see bullying amongst the students? My guest, Ross, and I explore the experiences he had as a young student, and we think about how actions, again, are a way of communication. His experience as a young child really impacted who he became. I learned so much in this conversation about how my own experiences may have influenced how I reacted to behaviors in and out of my classroom. What should we be teaching students in especially elementary school? What about the soft skills? And what comes up for you as Ross and I discuss his experiences of being bullied? to the podcast, Education Unimagined, where we give students an opportunity to share their voice in a system where often their voice is unheard. I ask them to share their experience and advice on how we can improve the experience for everyone. Welcome, Ross. I would love for you to start with telling us me and the listeners who you are. My name's Ross Lepola. I am a competitive power lifter and coach. That's my primary day job. And then I also do self-development with a podcast and a personal development group. Will you tell us about the podcast that you host? It's called Project Unchained. I started about two years ago in my self-development that I got to a point where I realized my silence only perpetuated the problems that I had faced and endured. I realized I needed to break that silence and start talking about it and been recording and putting episodes out about my youth and the struggles that I went through and how that carried on into my adult life. That's been fulfilling to connect with people, share their stories and have vulnerable conversations with them, the ones that we tend to avoid in society that having conversations as a way to to shed the layers. Yeah, actually how I found you, I started listening to your podcast and a lot of it was resonating with me as a teacher and a parent. I was really interested to hear about your story growing up and some of what school was like for you. Yeah, school was tough for me. Elementary was probably tougher than middle school or high school. We were all in one school. Northern Minnesota was a really small town called Cotton, and we were all in one building, K through 12, around 300 students. So it's really small. Everybody knows everybody. I never really seemed to be able to find my place. And as a result, I definitely received the brunt of a lot of bullying on the bus, at school, all over the place. And the thing that is difficult about that was it became the things that I started to believe the things that I heard. And then I couldn't get away from it. It came home with me. It was in my head constantly. So not only were other people making fun of me, I was making fun of myself in a sense. That old expression of sticks and stones may break your bones, but words may never hurt you is just a bunch of crap. And one of the things that got told to me a lot is the way to try and fix it and cope with it, but it didn't do any good for me. It just perpetuated it. In a sense, it invalidated my experiences and invalidated what was going on for me because it did hurt. And with that becoming my self-talk, the summer going into seventh grade, I was even suicidal. I didn't see a way to make it stop. I didn't value myself. I didn't know how to make the voices, that conversation shift or change. I didn't know how to stop it. And that was the only way that I could understand or think to make it stop. Later, I found sports and sports became that way to exercise some of that anger. And I was good at it, so it also gave me a sense of confidence and self-worth. Long story short, it also covered it up because now that was my identity, my validation, my self-worth. When that went away, as I got older, a lot of those insecurities were still there and still present in my behavior, and I just wasn't aware of it. That radically impacted relationships. None of them were healthy for a long time in my life. I had some good friendships. There was definitely a lot of me seeking attention from other people. And it wasn't until I was 28 years later, I realized that that was a pattern of my life. And I was in a people-pleasing pattern. I was that nice guy and I didn't understand why. And I finally understood why because I'm not being me. I need to be more authentic. That was when I started my therapy and started working on myself and having a better relationship with myself. And that changed everything. It's a lot in that story that I'd love to unpack with you. I think 
interesting dynamic to have all of the students in one building and how that does impact student relationships in a positive way, but also in a pretty negative way in your case. And I want to ask more about your self-talk. How our peers really impact our self-talk and how do we challenge that self-talk that became your mantra? Is there thoughts or advice that you have from your experience on how we can challenge self-talk that comes from the outside in? That can be tough. A lot of that depends on what age a lot of that stuff starts to happen. One of the ways that I've understood that brain science has helped me with some knowledge and understanding to reshape myself came from the book, A Chimp Paradox. And I understood it from that book was when that happens prior to the age of eight is pretty well wired into your brain and you're not really going to be able to undo it. You just have to be aware of it to try and manage it. Whereas things after that age of eight, that neural pathway can be removed and replaced. One thing that's going to happen when somebody's calling you a name, especially if you don't necessarily understand it and you don't have a learned way around it, which you don't at that age, you're going to associate yourself with that and it's going to kind of get wired into your thought process. At the end of the day, you're not going to be able to necessarily go teach a nine-year-old how to rewire your brain to have better self-talk. Now, you can encourage them and you can be a source of a better talk and promote their strengths and point out to them where they're good and things of that nature based on how you talk to them. That can support that. But I don't know that there's necessarily a way to teach them how to redo that. At that real young age of elementary school, we should be focusing more on identity and validating who each individual person is and almost teaching those skills of compassion and kindness. But wow, I think parents need to hear that. Like at up until age eight. And that's a long time to be, especially in school. There's a lot of hierarchy happening in right around that six, seven, eight-year-old age frame. That's definitely a thing too, because you look at curriculum continues to get more and more advanced at a younger and younger age. And that's not allowing kids to learn more life skills and how to be with themselves. It's just teaching them knowledge. It's not teaching them intuition and self-connection about emotional intelligence or anything of that nature. Or social interactions, how to be with other people, how to navigate. We know that kids bring their home into school. And like you said, brought school home. It almost feels like school might be better served at creating skills and how to navigate social interactions at those young ages rather than content. Like there is so much more value in providing our own children different set of skills and tools, which is something that I promote a lot in leadership development is those soft skills. We both know that schools are going away from those and more towards that test or that content that seems to be more powerful. I've asked teachers to reflect on a teacher in their own life that had a negative impact on them and a teacher that had a positive impact on them. And the emotions that come up for these teachers when they realize that somebody in their own life impacted them in a negative way. Every person has a positive experience in school, one that they will tell everybody about, and a negative one that we still carry and shame us still to this day. And being more aware of them and having that time to say, oh, that probably wasn't the right approach for that situation, and being aware of that. And then talking to that first grader and saying, hey, I really, I took that approach in the wrong way. Just validating, seeing, having that connection, accepting responsibility. And I don't know that we do that really well as adults with children. That was one of the big things that I took away from Dana Martin's book, Radical Unschooling, was this idea of connection over correction. And 
I'm constantly, whenever I'm hanging with Rosalie and doing anything with her or other kids, I, I try and keep that in the forefront of my mind. Connection over correction. It can be hard because there's a lot of cultural things wired into my brain of I'm the parent, I'm the adult, I'm the authority. Connection over correction a lot of times removes that authoritarian paradigm and puts us all on the same level playing field. We're all humans, regardless of age, eight or 80, it doesn't matter. We need to get down on their level and connect with them because at the end of the day, we're the we're supposed to be the ones with the experience and the awareness to do that, to show them and cultivate that for themselves. That goes a long ways of going back to that younger person in the moment when you've made a mistake and apologizing and owning it. That does so much for creating and cultivating that connection with that person. At the end of the day, the only reason why people are blocked from doing that is from some sort of egoic attachment. And those attachments don't really serve us. I know for me, even when as difficult as it can be sometimes, admit to to Rosalie when I've made a mistake and apologize for that or something along those lines. Like I go into it like, oh man, like I got to own a mistake again. And I can feel that like ego trying to hold on and keep me from doing it. But the second I do it and I get past that on the other side, the reward from the connection is so much more than staying in that ego pattern. Yeah, I would love to accentuate that moment that you feel because I think often teachers are so afraid to accept or to have any other perception that they are perfect. And I don't know where that comes from, this myth that teachers are perfect. What impact do you think that has in the relationship from a teacher to a student? When I reflect on that, I don't know that I necessarily ever thought that any of them were perfect. I suppose the thing that comes to my mind more is the classrooms that I can recall where the teacher was really controlling of the environment and really trying to get through their agenda I hated. I had the worst time. I was one of those kids that was always in trouble in those environments because I don't want to sit in a desk all day. And I felt disconnected from them because when I reflect on it, I didn't like that environment. I didn't feel like it was one that was very caring of the kids. It was just a let's get this agenda applied and make them learn this to pass that test or whatever the motivation is behind it. And the other classes that I remember not only enjoying more, but lo and behold, I would learn more, were the ones that didn't seem as tied to the agenda. And we have to get through this. We have to get through that. Having a little bit more of a free flow to it and a carefree lightness to it all. Why do you think those teachers have those agendas? And I can say from experience in the classrooms where I didn't have an agenda, there was more connection. There was more collaboration. And every teacher will be told, don't smile until November. When I took that approach as a brand new teacher, there was no connection. Those kids didn't want to engage in my content. I would imagine that there are probably multiple influences into creating something like that. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of that comes from the expression of someone's own pain and hurt. What makes a person like that feel better, even though to me it's also temporary and fleeting, is that ability to control other people. If a person in general operates from that kind of lens and when the thing that they're trying to control, the other person or other things or other outcome is not happening the way they want it to, they get really upset and frustrated and overly emotional and get very reactive. An expression of some underlying pain and hurt that likely happened to them in their childhood. I think you're right exactly right on that. And I think you're speaking from really a variety of experiences. And so it feels really raw and honest coming from your thoughts. In reflecting back, what advice you might give to teachers about knowing about student bullying? We're told to be present, be more aware, and then bullying happens and it brings something up for us. And I think often teachers don't engage because we've been bullied. Maybe it's being bullied currently by our administrators, but also I think so many of us have been bullied in our lives that we don't know how to navigate when bullying is happening. And we're not talking about that. And you in your podcast often talk about the things we're not talking about. So tell me what you think about advice that that you would give to teachers. I like to think about this and ask myself the question, why do our kids continue to get bullied? I think the foundation answer to that question of why our kids continue to get bullied is because of us, adults. 
we set the example and we continue to bully. Kids are born without any learned behaviors. All behaviors are learned. We teach them how to behave by how we lead. We do not teach them how to behave by what we tell them. They're going to behave in based on more of a mimic form and they're going to follow what, how we lead by example. It doesn't take much of a search to see adult bully behavior. You don't have to go far on social media to see memes that are very hateful and derogatory towards groups of people for having a different belief or a different set of ideas. You see it all over in groups of people. There's still adults that will slam and make fun of other people in the group to jockey for a social hierarchy. I really like the way that you brought it up too when teachers. I look at uh, control as a form of bully behavior. You're trying to make somebody else do something else. And at the end of the day, the most fundamental human right, in my opinion, is the right of autonomy, regardless of their age. There's something that I have recently come to realize of my own teaching is that classroom management, that word management, requires me to A, sort and manage the kids that come in my classroom. And when they walk in the door, what else do I have but their identities that I can see and hear? And I don't get to know them. In order to manage a problem, I use the awareness that I have at my fingertips. And that tends to be surficial and not depth. We don't want to be managing our classrooms. We want to be allowing students autonomy to do what they want. And that is fearful for a teacher. I have recently started to think about as a teacher, if I let my students decide what they want to learn, then I have less control. And that that isn't what I've been told is a positive classroom environment. There's a lot that goes into being a teacher, and it's pretty powerful to take autonomy away from our students. Thinking back to one of the things I said earlier, there's no such thing as a bad kid or a misbehaved kid, only a kid who's lacking belonging and significance. So when that troublemaker in the class is disturbing the class, they're not feeling connected to where it is that's going on and they're seeking connection. I think if I were in that teaching environment, if I were to be able to be aware and be present with that and keep that in the forefront of my mind, I'm probably going to respond to that differently. But that's the other thing is the kid's only going to learn when they want to learn, regardless of what your curriculum is. Do you have advice to give adults now about how to help Ross at those ages to feel like he could have connected. I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but what advice could you give somebody like me who is in a classroom? I think trying to keep in the forefront of mind connection over correction, not controlling the behavior and connecting with the person to understand why they're behaving, if they're being rowdy and disruptive, if they're being attention seeking in a negative way, something along those lines, like that behavior is that communication. That kid at that age doesn't have the way to express it with words to say, hey, I'm really hurting inside here because the bullying or whatever it is that they're dealing with is, is painful to me and it hurts. Paying attention to that behavior and understanding a little kid is trying to express something through this behavior. I wonder what's going on for them. And instead of stop being a bad kid and sit in your seat or stop being bad or you're going to go in time out and so we get reprimanded for this bad behavior... When we're trying to communicate something inside of us, and that just teaches us to a cycle of suppression, we have to be able to express ourselves. So controlling the behavior shuts them down, creates disconnection. It also teaches them disconnection. I didn't feel like I could connect with anybody. I didn't have a way to express it. That underlying pain and hurt and lack of self-confidence and lack of self-worth was all still there. If you could get into their moments, what advice would you give to kids who are in the act of being a bully. Like, man, I, I see you. I hear you. I see your pain and hurt too. And we can create better connection with each other through a different expression. And I just want you to know that it's okay that you hurt too. And we can, we can deal with that together in a, in a better way. We can learn to love each other and love ourselves so that we don't have to lash out from a place of pain and hurt. I'm so glad I asked that question. I really love that advice. I haven't heard it as a teacher to really embrace and see bullies 
for what their challenges are. I mean, I think there is some of that out there, but I think that that's really powerful. And I love that advice, especially for teachers who might be listening. See the bullies, see the bad behavior, see them for the actions and the communication that they are trying to share with us. That is a great place for us to stop. Really, really appreciate you opening up, sharing your story, and giving those thoughtful pieces of advice. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. It was a a pleasure to join you today. I want to share an analogy about a basketball team. If you are creating a basketball team, the likelihood that you are going to stack your team with natural basketball athletes is pretty slim. You know, as a coach, that you have to train athletes to become better athletes. You have to coach them. You have to guide them. Leadership is the same thing. We have to train leaders. We have to guide leaders. We have to coach leaders. And if you or somebody you know is someone who could use some of those leadership trainings, I have a great program for you. It's called the Leadership Academy. And if you search peers, not fears, you will come across my Leadership Academy. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast Unimagined for all the amazing upcoming interviews that I have on the slate. The theme music for this podcast Unimagined was written and produced by another fellow educator, Keith McClendon. Imagine